Okay, Steve, the Word of God is alive and powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the body and asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All Scripture is God breathes. And it's profitable. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may become mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. We always say that the spiritual spin stops right here because we really care for you. Go Give us about 15 seconds or so, Steve, to prepare yourself for the study of God's word and prayer. And close out our prayer time. We'll begin our study. Father, it's a great privilege always to study your word. We ask your blessings on this study tonight. It's so important we receive, receive doctrine to be resident in our soul, especially in the times in which we face our country and around the world. We need to be prepared. So bless us in that lesson tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So before we before we begin, we're going to start and um, pick up with Acts chapter 21, verses 26 through 40. But before we begin, let me just say to uh, our friend, Miss Kat Kennedy is online with us again tonight. And uh, I want to thank um, Pastor, uh, Pastor Smith from um, Country Bible Church in Brim, Texas, for officiating Kat Cat's uh, husband's funeral yesterday. Uh, they streamed it online, and I had the the blessed privilege of uh, watching and attending the entire uh, uh, memorial service from right here in my home. And I'm I'm really grateful that Cat uh, had prepared for uh, Pastor Mike to do this and actually stream it live to the internet. Uh, I had uh, told Mr. Dub uh, Blackwood, whose funeral I'll be officiating this coming uh, Friday at um, 10.30, and I told him probably four or five years ago that I want to be the first pastor to stream live a funeral from a church service. And uh, uh, Dub passed away this just within about last week or so, so I didn't get a chance to do that, but I'm grateful for Mike, Pastor Mike Smith, for doing that for Cat because it was it was really really a nice nice service. Um, uh, Henry was honored. Uh, they spoke well of him. Uh, his uh, what a great character uh, had many many pictures and um, and Miss Cat had actually uh, designed some things. Where he was, um, Henry was a apparently a, a firearm specialist, and she had uh, she had like a 50 caliber bullet, and it had the 10 problem solving devices written on the side of it. There was a there was a, a nice vase that had uh, the some things written on the side of it, uh, doctrinal things, and uh, there were some like 50 caliber shells. That you know when they hit it and explode and expand, they look like flowers, mm -hmm. and they were on on a on a, like a brass pipe coming out of that uh, out of that plant, and they had many many pictures that were just really fine pictures of Cat and and Henry and and friends and that kind of thing. So uh, I'm grateful to Pastor Mike for for having shared that over the internet uh, with our friends out here. So let's go ahead and get into our into our Bible study now. We're actually in Acts chapter 21. There are 28 chapters in the book of Acts, and uh, I don't know how long it's taken. Well, I, I do know um, about how long it's taken us. I think it was in, in December of last year when we actually began this study. So three times a week from, from January, it's taken us an hour, and a, an hour to an hour and a half, an hour and 15 minutes at a time to get to chapter 21. And we're going to continue uh, till we get to the end here. So let's review what we saw last week in the first 25 verses of this chapter. Paul had met with James and other leaders and had given a, a, given a detailed report. Now remember, Paul was on his way from Miletus on his third missionary journey, and he's ending his third missionary journey by going to Jerusalem. And it's been somewhere between nine and ten years since Paul was actually in Jerusalem at the 
Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. Somewhere along the line, as we move toward the end of this, I want to go back and recap some of the highlights, the, 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 the chapter and the verse of certain things that we have uh, studied in the book of Acts where a transition was being made in this ministry. Now remember, the, the major theme of this whole study is to show evidence that the body of Christ, what has been called the church, did actually not start in Acts chapter 2. But the first person to become a born-again Christian was whom? Paul. Paul, that's right, the Apostle Paul. Do you remember what chapter that was in? In the way they... <laughs> nine. Nine. nine, that's right. Chapter nine. Chapter nine. nine. Now, here's what's happened. Paul's finishing a third missionary journey on his way to Jerusalem, and Paul is in Jerusalem now after having been warned by the disciples in the la in, in Tyre, don't don't put a foot in don't put a foot in Jerusalem. And what he, they were indicating was all along this way in three missionary journeys, everywhere you go, there's always trouble. They, they're persecuting you because of your belief. Paul says, no, I've got to go. So what we find here now in Acts 21, beginning with verse 26, Paul has just met with James, that's the, the half-brother of Jesus. He is the leader of the Messianic Assembly, not Christian Assembly, Messianic Assembly in Jerusalem. And there were men that were called elders. These were leaders of, of this assembly in Jerusalem. Paul is meeting with them. And he's going to give them a detailed report about all that God did among the Gentiles over the last nine to ten years. He gave that report. Second bullet point, God is glorified. These people just went wild because of the, the wonderful news of God's grace in saving Gentiles on this missionary journey. Then, what happened after he gave that report, good gracious, it all broke out again. So we, have, we find that there was a group of zealous Jews that showed up in Jerusalem, and they had actually come from someplace in Asia, and they had stirred up the people in Jerusalem regarding this man Paul and his ministry. The third bullet point, Paul's opposition was full of misinformation. Well, we know a whole lot about that, and if you have, you have your eyes on the news today, you'll see the fake news. You'll see the false information. You'll see what's going on. And I'm telling you, when you understand that we are involved, every human being is involved in, this, in the, the angelic conflict, now you understand why. Behind all this is Satan, not a direct attack from Satan, but he's using people to... to put forth evil information. And what is evil? Distortion of truth. Any distortion of truth, no matter how slight the distortion. So with that in mind, the, this, this opposition is full of misinformation. Then the next one, the Jerusalem leaders and James and these elders, and they went into a panic mode because they, they said, okay, hold it. Look, these people are here. They're, they're drumming up a mob. They're, they're, it's going to be violence. What in the world are we going to do? So the Jerusalem leaders shift into a panic mode after glorifying God. And then we, we looked at the question is, why is circumcision not a salvation requirement? Because many of the Messianic Jews who were legalistic were wanting Gentile converts to be converted over to Judaism and requiring them to be circumcised and actually follow the Mosaic law. So the question was, why is circumcision uh, not, a, not a salvation requirement? And if you remember, we went through a, a, lengthy, a lengthy study on Abraham. Remember, Abraham uh, was named to be a Jew by God when he was about 100 years old. And God had made a covenant with Abraham, and to seal that covenant, he had Abraham circumcised. Well, that was the seal on this uh, on this blessing of the covenant the covenant uh, relationship and all the blessings that go with that. Now, <laughs> what we see here then, <clears throat> after explaining through Abraham why uh, why uh, I'm going to have to sneeze here in a minute. 
Oh, gee. <clears throat> let me just let me just share a thought with you. Before my mother passed away in the latter years of her lives, life, she sneezed, and when she sneezed, it was always eight times. It was huh, two, three, four. Well, in the latter these latter years of my life, I'll tell you what. I started to sneeze. I never know what's going to happen. Bingo. And it might not be eight, but it might be two or three. I'm working on it, okay? <laughs> so anyway, um, we saw why circumcision wasn't a requirement. And the assembly, rec the, the assembly now, here's what happens. With this mob, mob growing out here, going to do violence to Paul, here's what they said. Why don't you take, we've got four guys here that have made a vow. Jewish men made a vow. Why don't you take them to the temple, and you you pay their you pay their fees, and you purify yourself while you're there? Well, that was going to take about seven days to do this, and they figured they, these um, Jewish leaders figured that since all this bad information that Paul was telling the Gentiles, you don't have to keep forsake the Mosaic law, no circumcision, none of that. But if they see you go into the temple. They see you in a purification process. Maybe they won't. Maybe they won't go wild. Maybe they won't do anything. So Paul followed that recommendation and went ahead and went into the temple and went through that purification process with those other four guys over a period of several days. Now, what we see then is that many authors, many theologians today, and even my mentor. Now, I'm not going to mention his name, but my mentor over the last 30 years believed that Paul was guilty of sin, that he was in reversionism when he did this. But when you understand the law of expediency and see what Paul says, I become all things to all men that I might save some. So when I'm with the circumcision, I become one of the circumcision and go through the process to make sure that I can evangelize them. If I'm with the uncircumcised, I do what is necessary there as long as I'm not violating a command of Christ for Christians. And we, talk, we talked about that being the law of expediency. We've mentioned that three or four times over the course of our study. Now we pick up in verse 26. Paul follows, recommenda follows the recommendation. And now, this is the recommendation uh, of the, the Jewish leaders. He says, then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself along with them, went into the temple giving notice. What kind of notice? Notice of the completion of the days of purification until the sacrifice was offered for each one of them. Now, let me point out something. That verse alone would probably require another hour's study. Because if I said to you, or said to many Christians today, okay, so Paul's taking a vow. He's going into the temple. Please explain that process to me. Well, you'd have to go back and read the Old Testament and see what that process was. Now, I think it was in, in, yesterday's, in yesterday's study, we actually talked about that, but we've got a passage of Scripture coming up here in just a minute that will help us understand something about this, this, uh, this vow, this purification that uh, these, these four guys are going to go through. Now, let's go back to this verse again. Then Paul took the four men. These are the four that have made the vow, and the, and the Jerusalem leaders have said, look, take these guys and go into the temple with them, okay? Said that, so the, he did that. The next day, after the recommendation was made that he do this, he was purifying himself along with them, the four men. They went into the temple giving notice. Paul went into the temple giving notice. What does that mean, he went into the temple giving notice? When you go into the temple, one of the things you have to do when you go there, if you're taking a vow, is to declare to the priest in the temple who's working in the temple at that point in time, you have to tell him what the intention is regarding this vow. So this public notice was simply Paul telling the priest what, what he was doing. What is your intention, Paul, about taking this vow? And then it goes on to say, he, he went into the temple giving notice of the completion of the days of the purification until the sacrifice was offered for each one of them. 
Now, let's take a look at this. Point number one, Paul himself did not take the Nazarite vow. But as often, but as often was the practice, he went into the temple, he went through the rite of purification, and stood the expense. No, that's when the that's when the, the leader said, Look, these guys are gonna have to pay something. They're gonna have to they're gonna have to come up with some money to pay for this for this off offering that they're doing. I want you to pay for these four men. So Paul stood the expense for the offerings which had to be made for these four men who were actually taking the Nazarite vow. Now the question is, what is a Nazarite vow? This is not something that you and I as a Christian are involved in. We don't do this kind of thing. This is under the Mosaic Law. We're not obligated to the Mosaic Law. But if you're going to understand the book of Acts, and understand why Paul did some of the things he did, being the first person in the body of Christ, being a born-again Christian, you're going to have to ask yourself, why did he do this? What is this all about? Okay? Number 16, beginning in verse 13. says, now this is the law of the Nazarite. This actually comes out of the Mosaic law, and this is what they had to do. Now, this is the law of the Nazarite, when the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall bring, in other words, he's gone through the entire process now. He says he shall bring the offering to the doorway of the tent of the meeting. It says he shall present his offering to the Lord. Now watch this. He's coming, this, the Nazarite is going, uh, taking his vow, he's going to have to bring this with him. One male, one male lamb, a year old, without defect, for a sin offering. Now stop right there for just a minute. What is that all about? One male lamb, a year old, without defect. Let me ask you this. What gender was Jesus? Male. He was a male. You see, every one, of these, every one of these offerings are going to represent something about the Lord Jesus Christ, who is not there at this point in time, but it's the Jesus Christ to come at the time of the incarnation, and so that when, when we move from here all the way to, to the time when Christ was born in 0 A.D., actually about 5, 5 B.C., when you, when you get the calendar readjusted, but when Jesus was born, that was the time when God became man. And all this back here was... A, it was prefigured this person who was going to come. So that the, by the time he comes physically, there is absolutely no excuse for the Jews to have missed him back then or even at the time of the incarnation. So it was one male lamb, a year old, watch this, without defect. Do you have any idea why it was without defect? Was because Christ was perfect. It was pointing to him. Then it goes on and say, uh, says um, not only one, um, one male lamb, uh, without defect, and that was for a burnt offering, and then one ewe lamb, a year old, without defect, for a sin offering, and one ram without defect for a peace offering. Now, I want you, want you to look at that. In verse 14, when you go through this Nazarite vow, you are bringing something to the temple for three things, a burnt offering, a sin offering, and a peace offering. Verse 15, and a basket of unleavened cakes. Question, do you have any idea what, why it's unleavened? Leaven in the Bible is a figure of, of sin. And Jesus was without sin, so that's why this is unleavened bread. This is why when we take the Lord's Supper, it is with, un, with unleavened bread. Indicating again, this is his body, it is a sinless body. And that's what we have here. So in verse, uh, in verse 15 again, a basket of unleavened cakes of fine flour mixed with oil, here's the Holy Spirit, and unleavened wafers, unleavened again, unleavened wafers spread with oil along with a, along with a grain offering and their drink offering. Now we've got five different kinds of offerings, a burnt, a sin, sin offering, a peace offering, a grain offering, and a drink offering. Uh, in every one of these, these are a prefigure of Jesus Christ in his humanity. Then in verse 16, it says, Then the priest shall present them, all these offerings, before the Lord, and shall offer his sin offering as his burnt offering. 
he shall also offer the ram for a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord, together with a basket of unleavened cakes. The priest shall likewise offer in its grain offering and its drink offering. Verse 18, the Nazarite then, after all these offerings have been made, remember, when you make a vow, you let your hair grow. And what happened here now, at the end of this vow, you've gone through this procedure. Now what's going to happen is you're going to shave your head and do something with your hair. Verse 18, the Nazarite then shall shave his dedicated head, head of hair, at the doorway of the tent of meeting, and take the dedicated hair of his head and put it on the fire, which is under the sacrifice of peace offerings. The priest, in verse 19, shall take the ram's shoulder when it has been boiled and one leavened cake out of the basket and one unleavened wafer and shall put them on the hands of the Nazarite, the ones taking the vow, after he shaved his head and dedicated his hair. Verse 20, then the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. It is holy for the priest together with a breast uh, with a breast offered by the waving of the and the high off, and the thigh offered by lifting up and afterward the Nazarite may drink wine that doesn't mean go get drunk okay it says this is the law of the Nazarite what we've just read here is the law of the Nazarite who vows his offering to the Lord according to his separation in addition to what else he can afford according to his vow which he takes, so shall he do according to the law of his separation. This is what Paul and these four men were doing at this period of time. They'd gone into the temple and had been going through this process. Now point number two. To all those theologians, and there are many out there, to all the theologians and authors, and there are many out there, who believe Paul is a sinning hypocrite, for taking the advice of James and these Jerusalem leaders, the following information must be considered. Now, let me point something out to you. I've indicated here that there are theologians and authors who believe that Paul was sinning. They believe that what Paul, when, when, the, uh, when the, uh, the disciples in Tyre had told Paul under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, don't set a foot in Jerusalem, that when Paul went, even though Paul said, hold it, guys, you know, just a second. I hear what you're telling me, but the Holy Spirit has been leading me from way back there in time. He's been leading me to go to Jerusalem. Well, what's happened, these theologians and these authors are saying, wait a minute. No, Paul made a mistake. And the reason for that, guess what? He gets into Jerusalem, he gives this report, and the next thing you know, they're beating him. They're beating him. This crowd is violently beating him, tearing him up. And he says, well, we, see, we told you, Paul, you shouldn't have gone. But remember on yesterday, I told you exactly why Paul was told by these, these disciples, why they told him don't go according to the Spirit and why the Holy Spirit told him to go. Why did those disciples tell Paul not to go? What was God doing there? Remember what it was? It was a test. See, Steve, if I tell you, man, listen, uh, the Holy Spirit's telling me, uh, no, don't, don't go out of this house tonight. There's some, there's something going to happen to you along the way. He said, no, 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 the Holy Spirit's leading me to go. Well, your wife's sitting over here. She heard me tell you don't go. He, she, she heard you tell me don't, that you're going to go. And what happens now, people begin to say, wait a minute. You've already been warned, Steve, and you walk out the door and get hit by a car. So, see, I told you, you should, believe, you should listen to Dr. Jim. But see, the reason you're going to go out the door, even though I've told you the Holy Spirit's leading me to tell you don't go, you're going to tell me I'm going because the Holy Spirit's leading me. And what happened is God provided a test for Paul to find out whether or not he was going to lead or follow the leadership of the Spirit. Do you, you understand what I just said? You got that? That's all it was. So what happens, you may have the Holy Spirit telling somebody two different things, telling you one thing, telling me something, I'm conveying that to you, and it seems like, man, something's wrong here. This is a conflict. It's no conflict. God did this to test Paul to find out whether he's going to do what the Holy Spirit was leading him to do. And knowing the fact 
that when he got to Jerusalem, he, that all this was going to happen, but we're going to find out just in advance that the reason, well, even as a result of all this, this all this violence, Paul is going to get an opportunity to speak to the rulers and kings, which it was prophesied that he would do. However, had he not gone to Jerusalem, he wouldn't have been able to do it. So to all those theologians and authors who believe Paul is a sinning hypocrite for taking the advice of James and the Jerusalem leaders to go to the temple, the following information must be considered. Remember this. This, this incident is occurring during what period of time? What do we call it? Look at your, look at your notes. The transition period. And the transition period is between Acts chapter, Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 28. And during that transition period, actually it really began, it really began in Acts 9. What happened is the, um, the, the, Israel, the Jews had actually blown it on several previous occasions. They went under the fifth cycle of discipline on two occasions, and they crucified the Lord Jesus Christ, their Messiah. So on the day of Pentecost, Peter is preaching the kingdom is at hand, which means that had, had the Jewish rulers and the Jewish people repented at that point in time, Jesus would have been back within a seven-year period of time, and there would have been no body of Christ. There would have been no period of time called the Age of Grace. Well, that's not what happened. So here we, we see in, in point two, even though Paul strongly taught Christians that Christians are not obligated. Let me say that again. Even though Paul strongly taught that Christians are not obligated to the Mosaic Law, Paul was not opposed to keeping the customs of the law as long as they did not interfere with his obedience to Christ. Do you, do you follow that? Do you understand that? Because if you understand that, that's going to help you to explain to somebody why Paul was not sinning, why he was not outside the will of God for his life by going to Jerusalem and going into the temple. Now here, for example, although Timothy, see the question is, was Paul really teaching Christians that, in, that you know, you don't, you don't have to be obedient to the law? Although Timothy was a Jew, because of his mother's ancestry, he had, he had never been circumcised. So while Timothy was traveling with Paul to Jerusalem, Paul had Timothy circumcised so that Timothy might be able to work among the Jews of that area. Do you realize that if, if Timothy had not been circumcised, he would not have been able to go into the temple? The Jews would have not listened to him because he is a Gentile, uncircumcised. In Acts chapter 16, verse 1, for example, we studied this five chapters ago. Paul, came, Paul was beginning his first missionary journey. And says Paul, Paul left uh, Antioch. He goes over to Derby, up around the up around the Mediterranean Sea. He's going he's going uh, uh, be going west going east at that point in time. And the first place he came to was Derby. Then he went from there to a, a small town or a place called Lystra. And when he got to Lystra, guess who he found? He found Timothy. And a disciple was there named Timothy. The son, of, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. But his father was a Greek. That means he was a Gentile. And he was, Timothy, Timothy was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Timothy was from Lystra. Derby is out, Derby is out to, the, to, the, uh, to, be to the east, and he's moving west. So just a little bit, a little bit on the other side of... Um, of uh, Derby was this place called Lystra. And this is where they found him. But when he got to Iconium, the next town on Paul's travels, these people in Lystra and Iconium, had they understood something about this young guy called Timothy. He was a disciple, but his, his lifestyle was such that word had spread all the way over here to Iconium. It says Paul wanted this young man to go with him. And he took him and circumcised him because the Jews who were who were in those parts, for all they knew, for all they knew that his father was a Greek. So Paul wants Timothy circumcised so that he'll have an opportunity to witness to the Jews and they won't be accusing him of 
wrongdoing. So Timothy's circumcision had nothing to do with keeping the Mosaic law. That's what you need to understand. Yes, Paul had Timothy circumcised, but it did not, it did not have anything to do with keeping the law. It had something to do with the law, but it didn't have anything to do with keeping the law. These, these comments are crucial to our understanding. There's a difference between keeping the law and just doing something for expediency. Then he says, his circumcision was a means of allowing Timothy to fit in so that he might teach among the Jews who firmly held that circumcision was essential. This was an application of the what? Law of the law of expediency. What that means, and Paul taught that. Paul taught the law of the law of love, the law of the law of freedom. He taught the law of expediency and the law of supreme sacrifice in the book of Corinthians. All of those, and every one of those laws relate to our capacity to preach the gospel to the unsaved. Then in point B. In the past, Paul, see, this is another, another reason why this idea of uh, these, uh, these Jews who are trying to get after Paul for um, trashing the Mosaic law, it says, in the past, Paul actually shaved his head in connection with a vow in Acts 18.18. 18. So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Sincrea, for he had made a vow. So he, in other words, what happened, why did he have his hair cut off? He'd made this vow, and his hair had been growing, and the time for him to cut that hair and go through the purification process was up, and so he did this. So we've got Timothy being circumcised, Paul taking, taking uh, a vow and having his hair, hair head shaved, going through the purification process, as an indication that Paul wasn't trashing the Mosaic law. Consider Paul's statement uh, to the Corinthians. And here's what Paul says to the Corinthians. Second there. In 1 Corinthians 9.19 and, follow, 9, 19 and following. Now listen to this, please. Listen to the phrase. Listen to, listen to the phrase as we go through. He says, for though I am free from all men. Now let me tell you what that means. That means that, that Paul isn't listening to you, Steve. He isn't listening to Marshall. He isn't listening to me. He isn't listening to any of you out there. He is, he is a free man. His, his, his love and attraction is to Christ and not to us down here. So here's what he says. For though I am free from all men, here's what he does. He said, I have made myself a slave to all. Now hold it right there. If you take a look at that phrase, um, I am free from all, from all men, question, give me two categories of people that would fall under all men there. What have, what have been tough? Gentiles and Jews. Jews and Gentiles, that's exactly right. So he's saying here, for though I am free from all Jews and Gentiles, I have made myself a slave to all. Who's all? Jews and Gentiles. Jews and, Gentiles. and that's where we ought to be. For he says this, so that I, why is he doing that? He said, I'm a slave to all so that I may win more. What that means is that he, as he preaches the gospel of grace, he's going to accommodate himself and the people he's witnessing to in order to make sure he's not doing anything that's offensive so that they will listen to him when he preaches the gospel. Verse 20, he said to the Jews, I became as a Jew. Now, what does that mean? If he became as a Jew, that means that there are certain customs that he might follow, he might follow, like going into the temple, not sinning to do that, but as a, as a matter of expediency, he's going to take up some of these customs so that he'll have the freedom to preach the gospel to the Jew. So he says, to the Jew, I became a Jew, so that I might win Jews. But to those who are not under the law, who's that? Gentiles. Gentiles. See, the Gentiles are not under the law. He said, "So to those who are under the, uh, to the those who are not under the law." See now, uh, as and let me see here. Just to those who uh, 
let me let me go back and read verse 20. To the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law. You see that? Do you understand what he's saying? He said, look, I'm not under the law, but if I'm going to win Jews, he said, I have to function as though I'm under the law. I'm not really under the law, but I'm going to function there so that I can win some. Then he says in verse 21, he said, to those who are without the law, who's that? The Gentiles. Gentiles. He says, as without the law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ. So what's he going to do? He says, so that I might win those who are without the law. And then in verse 22, he said, to the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have, I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. And that all means means that if the law of expediency must be placed into action so that I can witness to you and tell you about the gospel of Christ and, and you might become saved, I'm going to do it. That is the law of expediency. Now let's look at point, point number three. What Paul was doing was applying the law of expediency. When spreading the gospel of grace, not the gospel of the kingdom now, but the gospel of Christ, that's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, period, over and out. That's the scripture. So he says, when spreading the gospel of grace among unbelievers, do not offend them needlessly. Now, this is, this is our statement here. It's an application. Do not offend them needlessly, but conform to their innocent customs regarding such things as dress, language, modes of travel, sitting and eating. Now, let me just give you an idea. And I use, and I too, I use these, two, uh, these two illustrations. I'm looking to see who's online with us right now. Because I'm looking to see if there's somebody from outside the country. Because we frequently have somebody from outside. Now look, in 1986, 1985, 1985, no, I'm sorry, 1986. In 1986 and 1988, I made my first two trips to South Korea. We were in Seoul, South Korea. And... Dr. Park came and picked us up at the, at the hotel and took us out to a place where we were going to evangelize. And it was in a business, a big factory kind of business. I said, wow, you know, we're going to, uh, we can't do this in the United States. They shut down everything. So they shut down everything and they prepared a meal for us in this factory. They took us into, the, into, the, um, uh, into a room where the tables were set. They had all kinds of food out there, but mainly fish. And there's a great big long fish, whole fish that's on the table. And when they prayed, they said, okay, pastor, you're, you're a guest here. Just go ahead and get your, you get your food first. I had chopsticks. You remember what I did? I had chopsticks. I reached over and got the eyeball out of that fish with two chopsticks, picked it up, put it in my mouth, and chewed it and ate it. They looked at me and said, in their, in their non-English, said, what did you do? Say, we didn't think an American would do that. Guess what? I became one of them at that time. I'm telling you right now, it was just like it was just like I'd grown up there. Yeah, you saw eye to eye with them. Was that? Yeah, saw eye. Yeah, saw eye to eye with them. That's what Steve said. No, but I mean, this is this is what we're talking about. So, then I tell people that story, and they look at me and says, "Oh no, you you didn't do that." Yes, I did. You need to say that that's not the first time you've done that. So. Well, okay. Yeah, just, my wife just said, "Be sure to say that that's not the first time you've done that." Yeah, really, and that. But I, I knew they didn't know that. No, they didn't know that. Didn't know. But I just became one of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, it was just like this old home week, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to evangelize and people get saved and good grief. Well accepted. Yes. So now, the next thing is, um, is when I went to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. In the Philippines, they've got some things that, uh, some wonderful fruit. 
but uh, there's one that's called a durian. And what they what they say about this, it smells like Hades, but it tastes like heaven. Well, I when they offered that to me, I uh, I said okay, but I I was convinced that after it was all over, it smells like Hades, and it tastes like Hades. <laughs> <laughs> now, Cody, you were with us. I mean, you Cody, but you were with us in Korea, were you not? Yes. Yeah, Cody went with us. Now, I don't remember, re, know whether he remembers this occasion or not, but I'm telling you. So now, there's another thing in the Philippines. Not only did they not only have the durian, I mean, they gave it to me every way possible. The last thing was ice cream. They said, oh, maybe the ice cream would be okay. <laughs> no, it doesn't smell good. It didn't taste good. I could never, could never get past that. Now, there was another thing that, uh, that we did, and that is in, in, the, uh, in, the, um, in the Philippines. About 10 o'clock at night, you'd hear this person coming down the street. Is da, is da, is da. And Carlito would go out and he'd beckon the guy to come and he'd bring something in. And it was Balut. Now that's, and do you know what Balut is? <laughs> it's about a 16 day old chicken in an egg. Yeah. In other words, they, they take the egg, the fertilized egg, they incubate it, and about 16 days into the, into the uh, process of growing, you break, you, you, break the, you break the shell and you eat the chicken. Now, if you get it at 16, what's that? I thought it was a duck. Well, there yet can be duck, too. Oh, okay, it could be yeah, a duck. It could, could be, be duck, yeah, okay. you can do it. It could be any kind of a thing along the way. Yeah. So here's the issue. If you don't get it at 16 days and you get it at 18 days, you know that at 18 days, 20 days, it, it, it's growing, you know. So depending on, depending on how old it is, you may have to, you may have to pick the toe, toenails out of your mouth, you know, when you're chewing this thing. But anyway, so here's the issue. The question is, will, in, your, in this area, if someone offers you a balloon. No, I can't eat one of those things. But I'll tell you what, you take one and put it in your mouth, you peel that, don't make a face when you do it, you become one of them. Now, it's sort of that, it's that kind of thing that I'm talking about was, was going on here, you know. You're looking for transportation. Cody, we were looking, there were se about seven of us, wasn't there? Seven Americans. Okay. And I, this this part of the Bible study, folks, this is what we're talking about here. Cody Humphrey, me, John Paul, John Farmer from down in uh, down in Birmingham. We had seven seven Americans, and we're looking for a taxi. We're down in the tourist section. We're looking for a taxi. Well, here it comes. The taxi pulls up and opens the door, and this thing it what it must have been. Yeah, I'm, what? Small. small. Yes, it was small. I mean, it was two seats, mm -hmm. but seven Americans crammed in this with a driver, and they had they had people along the along the street waiting for a taxi. Also, we crammed into that back seat and that front seat. Seven of us plus a driver, and it was like getting in a Honda <laughs> or a Toyota, something very small car. We got in that thing. And the people on the street started to laugh. There were so many of us in the car, it would hardly pull away, and the tires were nearly flat. Oh, I'm telling you, the tires were nearly flat. Uh -huh. So here again, you know, what do you do? You want transportation? You do what they do. You just jump in and cram it up, I guess. So look at point three again. Paul was applying the law of expediency when spreading the gospel of grace among unbelievers. Do not offend them needlessly, but conform to their innocent customs regarding such things as dress, language, modes of travel, sitting and eating. Paul was not a sinning hypocrite for any of those things that we just talked about above. No. What was he doing? Here it is. Paul was doing nothing more than applying the law of expediency. Paul was not violating any dictates of honesty or truth. Paul was applying the law of expediency 
during tremendous opportunities to present the gospel in Jerusalem. Is that clear? So here's the issue, folks. I don't know that you'll ever have an opportunity to do something like this, but if you're ever faced with a situation where you're asked to do something, you know that you want to witness to this person, and you're required to follow a custom that you're not accustomed to as long as it does not violate a, a, a truth of God's word for you as a Christian, you need to fall into line, otherwise you miss the opportunity. Point five, the purification ceremonies continued for seven days. That's when Paul was in the, uh, in the temple here. He came out of the temple, but it was lasted for seven days. Now watch what happens. They come out of the temple. Paul is seized in the temple. Verse 27, when the seven days of purification were almost over, the unbelieving Jews from Asia, this is a group of Jews that had come from Asia, that had come from off somewhere else. And, they, and upon seeing Paul and seeing him in the temple, they began to stir up all the crowd, and what they do? They laid hands on Paul. Now, what does all that mean? These Jews were from Asia. In other words, they're from out of town. These are not Jews who had believed on Jesus Christ through Paul's preaching on one of these missionary journeys. They are unbelieving Jews who had caused him so much persecution. So when you go back there and look at Paul's travels and seeing all these Jews persecuting him, these are some of those Jews who have come to Jerusalem. Okay, But back in Asia, these Jews had to... Now, this is interesting, too. Back in Asia, these Jews had to restrain themselves in their persecutions. In other words, they couldn't do it there. They had to restrain themselves because of the Roman, Roman governors. Remember, under Rome, Rome at that point in time, in the Roman Empire, they were an empire of law and order. So what happened is when they began to stir up trouble in some of these cities, that were under Roman rule, the Roman government would come down on them. And oftentimes they would provide for a local city there some sort of freedom because of who they were. And if they stirred up this trouble and broke the law, they would take those freedoms away. So here's what happened. Back in Asia, these Jews had, had to restrain themselves in their persecutions because of the Roman governors. But now they are in Jerusalem where they feel free to do their very worst to Paul, okay? Now let's move on from there. Point number three. These unbelieving Jews that had come from off somewhere else in Asia said hated Paul. Why did they hate him? Here's why they hated him. Because he, Paul, dared to put Gentiles on the same level with the Jews who are God's chosen people and then claim that Gentiles could be saved apart from the Jewish religion. You see that? So this is why they were, this is why they were after him. Now, what we have, we're going through this transition period, see? Now, in verse 20, 28, lies and more lies. Well, what about this? In verse 28, crying out. These, these people were crying out. Now, these are the, this is the mob. They're crying out, men of Israel. Come to our aid. That means to help us. This man, Paul, who preaches to all men everywhere. Hold it now. He said, who preaches to all men everywhere. And what is he preaching to all men everywhere? He's against our Jewish people. And he is against the Mosaic law. And this place, so he's against the, he's against the Jewish people. He's against the Jewish law. And he's uh, the Mosaic law. And he's against the temple. And then they go on and say, and besides, he even brought Greeks, that's Gentiles, into the temple and it's defiled the holy place. These are the lies that were being perpetrated at that point in time. Now, it's it, now watch, now, now yesterday I believe I indicated to you, look this way. Yesterday we indicated that when Paul went to, went to the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, there was a small, and I, I, I went like this, a, a, just a small circle. There was a small circle of people indicating what, however many Messianic Jews there were, that's Jews who believed in the Messiah, there was a small group. 
But nine to ten years later, Paul goes back to town, and the scripture says, now there are, the, the leaders told, there are thousands of these Jews in Jerusalem now. So in that nine to ten years that Paul was gone, there many of these Jews, as a result of Pentecost, had become born-again believers, not Christians, Messianic Jews. But what happened now is these Jews from from Asia, they come into town and they're stirring these this multitude of people, not the mess, not the small group. They're stirring up this big group out here so that when Paul comes into town, they're going to get after him. So that's where these people have been lying. They've been lying to these Messianic Jews, those thousands that have been converted within the last nine to ten years. So in point number two, they were accusing Paul of teaching all men everywhere to be against the people of Israel to be against the Mosaic law, to be against the temple, and the truth is that none of that was true. Now we have, this should be false, false assumption. I'm going to take that, a, that second A out of there. False assumption with no facts. Here's what happened. They, they were falsely assuming something, and they had no facts. For they, that is these Jews from Asia, they had previously seen Trophimus, a Gentile, the Ephesian in the Ephesian in the city of Jerusalem. Now watch this. Trophimus was a Gentile. He was from Ephesus. These Jews see Trophimus in the temple. So what they're going to do is they're going to assume that it was Paul who took them into the temple. You see that? Follow that? They've seen him in the city. In the city. Yes. The, 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 no, no. Look here. For they had previously seen temple, uh, seen Trophimus, the Ephesians, in the city. He was in Jerusalem. And they, these Asians then, they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. So when Paul was in the temple, Trophimus shows up. They say, oh, yeah, you brought him in, you brought him in there. So now they're out spreading false rumors that Paul had brought a Gentile into the temple. Okay? Now, let me, let's make some comments about that. And these are some applications that you might make today in terms of what's going on. To bring a Gentile into the temple was to pollute the holy place. We understand that. But this was a false assumption based on no facts. See, they were, they were accusing Paul of bringing this guy into the, into the temple. They were assuming that was true, but it was based on no facts. That was just an assumption. The fact is that Paul did not bring Trophimus into the temple. They were looking for an excuse to do harm to Paul, and that's the way that religion works. And I'm telling you right now, you had better take a look at all that's going on and, in, in, and what has happened today. Listen, I looked, looked here today, and I saw uh, Geraldo Rivera, uh, and there are others that are just bashing the president. And I'm telling you right now, I want you to know something right now. Those of you online, if you don't like this, just log off. And don't ever come back if that's what you want. Because here's the issue. Donald Trump is not a racist. Nope. Donald Trump is not a racist. <laughs> and here's the issue. I'm not, I'm not for Donald Trump per se. And I heard someone, the, the, matter of fact, the lady that was leading this, uh, this discussion on, uh, at 5 o'clock made this statement. She said, it's, it's, not about, it's not about Trump, it's about what he believes. And he is bringing this country back to its, founding, its foundation. So what happens is, is that you may say you're for Trump, but it's not a matter of being for Trump. It's not, him, it's not identity politics, it's for what he believes. And the truth of the matter is, everyone in this room, as far as I understand, understands what this nation is all about, and the truth of the matter is, you don't have to be for Trump. What you're for is the getting back to where we belong as a nation. And those, those young congresswomen now, every one of them, if you, are, listen, if you think for a moment that they are right, you are on the wrong side of history. And here's the reason why. They are anti-America, period. You can't be a socialist and be pro-American. You can't be for no borders and be biblical. These are biblical principles. 
free market capitalism, borders on a nation, law and order. <coughs> you can't be a Muslim. No, you can't be a Muslim. You can't be a Muslim and be an American. Period. Nope. Just read this information. Read about it. So yes, I, I'm a little passionate about this. That I guess really. But I'm here to tell. That's Steve. That's why I said that we. The, the you said the spiritual spin stops right here. I'm going to give you the truth, whether you like it or not. And so Paul goes into Paul goes into the into the temple. He knows what's going. He's going to Jerusalem. He knows what's going to happen to him. And I find it I find it very interesting. There was someone someone wrote something today about having a particular uh, a party sticker on the back of the back of their car, and somebody pulled up in behind the car, and wouldn't let the wouldn't you know block. The, blocked the passage of the woman until she got out of the car, and he made some remark about about the the, the Democrat Democratic uh, bumper sticker. And he were ranting about what this guy did. I'm telling you right now. I say if I went outside today with a with a MAGA hat on, I will guarantee you that I'd have the same kind of persecution, but from the opposite side. So the issue is not Trump, it's not Pelosi, it's pa it's the it's the, what is this nation about? And we need freedom in this country. It won't be free, but we need freedom to evangelize the lost, worship as we desire, send out missionaries, and be a friend of Israel. Period. Over and out. Right. Right. Now, I'll stop preaching. Page four. No, yeah, page, yeah, page four, yeah. Yeah, that, that bullet, bullet point says the people had Yeah, that, that's right, see, top of the page. The, see, these people had to lie mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the circumstance in order to justify their intention. How, why, well, you know, we're going to kill Paul. We're going to kill him. Well, how are we going to do it? We'll just lie. Yeah, fake news, lie. So all you have to do is, and here's the issue. If you believe what is being given to you on CNN, MSNBC, ABC, BB, A, CBC, NBC, if you believe in the Washington Post, if you're believing all that kind of stuff, if you're out there on Twitter and listening to that stuff, on Facebook and seeing some of that stuff that's out there, you have to have doctrine resonant in your soul coming straight out of the Bible to have a measuring strip to know when the, what, whether somebody's lying or telling the truth. That's the issue. So what we see in verse 30 is the hypocrisy of religion. And just remember this, Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. With the Holy Spirit indwelling you, teaching you, bearing witness, confirming the truth, so that you can go out into the marketplace, in the public square, and present a world, biblical worldview to the people out there. Here's what it says. Then all the city, whoo -hoo, then all the city, Jerusalem, was provoked. Now, how did, how did the city get provoked? It's because these Jews that came in from Asia stirred up that crowd for when Paul came into town. <clears throat> and so what happened? He provoked these people. They, they, they provoked these people, and the people rushed. They ran together, and taking hold, violently seizing Paul, the people then dragged him out of the temple, out of a religious location, and immediately the doors were shut. Well, what does all that mean? This, quite, this is quite a contrast between, and notice this, this is, quite, this is Jerusalem. This is quite a contrast between Acts 2, Pentecost, and this situation in Acts 21. In Acts 2, the Holy Spirit was poured out, and there were about 3,000 people saved. But in Acts 21, 3, 30, right, it should be 30, says the Jews were blaspheming the Holy Spirit and trying to murder God's messenger of grace. You see the, you see the, the difference between those two? In Acts chapter 2, the whole city of Jerusalem was stirred and amazed by the miraculous manifestations of the Spirit. Now, 10 years later, the whole city had become a howling, bloodthirsty mob. 
Verse 30 presents the hypocrisy of religion. What is it? Religion, here's, here's the definition. Religion, what is religion? Religion is man by man's efforts, doing works, trying to please God. There's no way possible to do that. However, Christianity is a spiritual way of life. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has a responsibility given to him by God the Father to take you out of your position in Adam and place you permanently in the position of Christ. Then he indwells you to perform his ministry in you. Religion sponsors this riot. The riots going on in Jerusalem right now is sponsored by religion, the Jewish religion. That is that is religious, unbelieving Jews and or Messianic Jews who are legalistic. So religion sponsors this riot, but religion doesn't want any blood in the temple. So after Paul was dragged out of the temple, the Levites, that's the people who are running the temple at that point in time, what do they do? The Levites immediately closed the doors, lest blood would be, would be shed in that holy place. Now in verse 31, Jerusalem at this point in time now is in confusion. While they, the Jews, were seeking, that means desiring to kill Paul, well, I mean, there it is. What are they trying to do to him? They're trying to kill Paul. These are religious Jews. While they were seeking to kill Paul, a report came up to the commander of the Roman cohort, and that word cohort means Roman group, that all Jerusalem was in, conf it was in confusion. So what we have here is a, a Roman commander and a, and a military brigade that's there in Jerusalem, and we'll see something about that. The fortress of Antonia, built by Herod the Great and named after Mark Anthony, was located at the northwestern corner of the temple area. So what happened is this, this Roman um, group was in a location where they could actually see what was going on around the temple. Then the next page. So a garrison of Roman soldiers was stationed at the northwestern corner of the temple area, especially, why were they there? They were there to, to maintain order at Jewish festivals. Okay? These sentries in the tower could observe everything that happened in the temple area, and when they saw the uproar below, they flashed word to the chief captain, Claudius Lysias, who's also mentioned in Scripture, who immediately ran down with a group of armed soldiers. The Roman commander now, in verse 32, is on the scene. At once, the Roman commander took, that means he grabbed those present, and he didn't reach out and grab them this way. He said, come on, guys, go with me. He grabbed them, okay? So at once the Roman commander took along with him some soldiers and centurions, and they ran down to the Jewish mob. And when the Jewish mob saw the Roman commander and the soldiers, they, the Jewish mob, they stopped constantly beating Paul. They were constantly beating him. But when the, when the soldiers showed up, let's stop that right now. So here's Rome's policy. Rome's policy was law and order throughout the entire empire. I've already mentioned that to you. We've mentioned that a couple of times in the past in some of the studies. So Rome is for law and order. And when the Jewish mob saw the Romans, they stopped beating Paul. There is no idea here of catering to the religious Jews, as in the case of Pontius Pilate. You see, what happened is with Pontius Pilate, the Jews catered to him. They, oh, no. no we, here, and so what happened, Pontius Pilate gave in to the Jews. However, at this point in time, this Roman, this Roman commander is not going to give in, in to anybody. He's going to follow the law. He's going to do what he needs to do. So here there is no idea of catering to the religious Jews, as in the case of Pontius Pilate. Well, no, just, just second there, uh, uh, just a second, sir. I know you're a commander in the Roman army, but Hey, look, you know who this guy is? Turn him over to us. He said, oh, yeah, here he is. No, he didn't do that. That's not the way it goes. So the issue is this. A riot is a riot in the, in the Roman Empire, regardless of who is involved. 
I, wouldn't you like to? Wouldn't you like to say, okay, so a riot is a riot in the Roman Empire. How about? How would you like this? A border is a border in the United States. How about that? So while religious Jews were not behind this riot, the Roman the Roman commander moved right in to stop it. So while religious Jews were behind the riot, I think I should have said, the Roman commander moved right in to stop it. So before the Jewish mob would start rioting, they had to see force. So they're not going to stop until they see force. Yep. And he moved in. Then in verse 33, Who are you and what have you done? Now this is going to be the Roman commander talking to Paul. Now watch this. This is interesting. He said, Then the Roman commander came up and personally took hold of Paul and ordered Paul to be bound with two chains. And he, the Roman commander, began asking Paul who he was and what had he done. So here's the issue. This Jewish commander sees all this mob out here, and he sees this guy. Oh, this is the guy, this is the guy here that's causing all the problem. So they grab him, they chain him, and then he looks at him and says, excuse me now, uh, what have you done, and what's going on here? So here's what happened. The commander walked out of the barracks and seized Paul, and he commanded Paul to be bound with two chains. Next page. And as soon as Paul was bound, the commander starts to inquire. He begins to make an investigation. And the, now, now this, this, is, this is one of those things where if you're just reading your Bible study, it's, you don't get this. This commander doesn't assume anything at the moment. He was objective. That's right. He was objective. And we're going to see that. In other words, he didn't say, okay, yeah, you're guilty. All these Jews out here, yeah, they, you must have been doing something. Take him off, drag him off, get him out of here. No, no, no. This commander doesn't assume anything at the moment. What he demanded to know from Paul was what uh, was what had you done? What what's going on here? What have you done? And in verse 34, we see confused and inconsistent accusations of the mob. Confused and inconsistent accusations of the mob. So the commander's got him. He got Paul. He's got him bound up now, and he's trying to investigate. But it says that among the crowd. These the deceived Jews. Now, remember, this is a group of people that these Asians have come in and poisoned, okay? But among the crowd, the deceived Jews, some of the crowd were shouting one thing, and some were shouting another. Paul did this. That guy did that. Somebody did this. He did that. So the total confusion. And when he, the Roman commander, could not find out the facts, because of the uproar, the Roman commander offered Paul ordered Paul to be brought into the barracks. Let's get him out of here. Let's get him. We, we're trying to find out what's going on, but we can't find out, out here. Too much noise. These people are confused. Let's take him inside, okay? So that's exactly what they're going to do. So in verse uh, 30, uh, 34, but among the crowd, these deceived Jews, some were shouting one thing and some were shouting another. So he's going to take them inside the barracks. I'm sorry, I read that before. Now, let's take a look at what that means. The deceived Jews were hurling out so many charges that the commander was uncertain about the charges that were being brought against Paul. So the commander ordered Paul to be taken into the barracks. The commander knew that a verbal de de uh, deposition, the commander knew that a verbal deposition was going to be impossible. How are you going to question this guy out here with all this noise going on? So he said it didn't take the Roman commander long to realize that he wasn't going to get an accurate deposition from the crowd because they were saying this on one side, they're saying something else on the other. So what happened? Paul was taken into the barracks. Now we get a reaction then from the mob. Okay, take him in the barracks, but we get a reaction from the mob. When Paul got to the stairs, going in the barracks, when Paul got to the stairs, Paul was carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. Get him out of here. Paul is now being carried upstairs. 
because of the Roman law, though, the mob knows that since Paul is now in the hands of the Romans, it will be very, they will have very little opportunity to kill Paul. Okay? Now, in next verse, the mob follows Paul and Romans who are carrying him. Verse 36. It says, For the violent multitude of the people kept following them, shouting, Away with him! Away with him! Well... The soldier had to literally carry Paul up the steps to protect him from the violence of the mob as the crowd called, cried, away with him. Now listen, listen to this. Away with him. These are the same words that the Jewish mob shouted years before at the crucifixion of Jesus. Away with him. Away with him. Now they're saying the same thing about Paul. Away with him. John 19, 15. So they cried out. This is at the, this is at, at the cross, the crucifixion. It says they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but whom? But Caesar. Now it should be obvious that the multitude of Jews wanted Paul dead in this Acts 21. In verse 37, Paul and the commander have a conversation because he's trying to get evidence. He wants to know what's going on. So he says in verse 37, as Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the Roman commander, may I say something to you, commander? And he said, Paul said, do you know Greek? In other words, Paul wants to talk to him. And the first thing he's asked, can I ask you a question? I want to say something to you. The guy said, yeah, okay, yeah. Paul says, do you know Greek? Now what we need to understand is this. This Greek that he's talking about is an, aris, an aristocratic form of Greek. It's an aristocratic form of Greek. This is kind of high talk up here, okay? So Paul begins the conversation by using the Greek language. And this shocked the Roman commander. This isn't all. Paul spoke the Greek of, uh, the Greek, of Greek aristocracy, and that shocked the commander even greater. The Roman commander realized that Paul is a man who speaks like an aristocrat. Now watch this. Therefore, the Roman commander realized that Paul was not just some lawless person. The mob was beating up. The Roman commander's native language, this Roman commander now, his native language was Latin. But he also understands Greek. That means he was bilingual, as were all great Romans in that part of the world. And this verse indicates that Paul and the Roman commander were able to carry on an objective conversation for the following reasons. Paul has sufficient pertinent doctrine risen his soul. And the Roman commander represents law and order in the Roman Empire. Now in verse 38, we have a reference to criminal activity of the Egyptian. Because what happens now, this Roman commander finds out something he didn't know. Then you are not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness. This Roman commander, when he saw him, assumed that Paul was this, this criminal. Okay? So the Roman garrison commander had made up his mind that he had finally captured the head of the great criminal ring known as the Sakari, but in reality he had not. Here's a bit of history about the Egyptian gangster. This Egyptian gangster had led a revolution about 5th AD 54. He had announced himself as a prophet because he knew that this was the only way to convince the Jewish people of his legitimacy. He believed that the Jews wanted to, be, wanted to overthrow Rome, so he announced that he was a prophet who had come to assist in their deliverance. This indicates that many religious Jews sided with the gangster. His organization managed to arouse 30,000 people in Jerusalem who wanted this revolt. On a, date, on a given date, the Egyptian called for the Jewish people to go up to the Mount of Olives and told them that they, when, when they prayed, the walls of Jerusalem would fall. So this gangster, this fraud, he stood up and prayed, and while he was doing so, the Roman garrison came to him and killed 400 and took 200 captive. The gangster element that organized this uprising was composed of 4,000 men. That's what the scripture says. 
But what happened is they escaped back into the Negev, the desert, where they continued their operations for next to 40 years. Wow. Verse 39. Paul answers the question now. He says, are you, are you this guy? He says, but Paul said, hey, I'm a Jew of Tarsus and Cilicia. I'm not an Egyptian, a citizen of no insignificant city. And I beg you, allow me to speak to the people. Paul is talking to the Roman officer. He isn't telling the Jews he's a Jew. He's telling this Roman officer he's a Jew. The fact that Paul is from Tarsus gives the Roman commander his first clue, a citizen of no insignificant city. That indicates that Tarsus had been made a free city by the Roman Empire. Paul's, Paul's polite request, Paul's polite request indicates that both Paul and the Roman commander are both objective in a pressure situation. This last bullet point that I just said right there, this last bullet point indicates two things to us. Objectivity is expected where sufficient doctrine is risen in your soul. That's Paul. When the certain divine laws are followed by the human race, it produces unusual people in good leadership. That's the Roman commander. Illustration of the point. This Roman commander represents everything that is good in Roman Empire because he is relaxed and objective and is actually making his investigation on the spot before he makes his decision. He is going to make his decision based on facts related to the circumstance. Verse 40, Paul's witness and testimony begins. When Paul, when he, when he, the Roman commander, had given Paul permission, Paul standing on the stairs motioned to the people with his hand to obtain silence. And when there was a great hush, he spoke to them in the Hebrew dialect, which is Aramaic, saying, now we got to come back Sunday to find out what he said, because we're done with chapter 21, and we're going to pick up with chapter 22, this next uh, uh, chapter 22 on Sunday. Paul is now going to witness and give his testimony as he speaks to the people. Steve, pray for us. Paul, it's a great, great, interesting study tonight. We know that Paul was so bold in following yes. the, the Spirit's lead, knowing what would happen, but knowing it would give him a great opportunity to, in your kingdom to work, work. And sometimes we may be thought, cha challenged with that same opportunity. Yes. But we know we follow the leadership of the Spirit. We we'll never go wrong. So thank you for this great, applicable lesson for tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, hang on for me just a minute. I want to thank all of you who are online with me tonight uh, on uh, WebEx. And I want to ask all of you who are actually on Facebook to go ahead and make a post. Just say something. Put your name, say hi here, whatever, so that I'll know that you're there. And I really appreciate your, uh, your being a part of our ministry here. I'm going to go ahead and shut down our, um, our um, uh, Facebook streaming. And we'll be back uh, Wednesday night with Chaplain Steve, okay? Now I'll go ahead and actually stop the recording here. And I will also stop the... Uh, uh, go ahead and end them in this service.